Kelly. I'm Dr. Laura Schlesinger. I do welcome you to this hour of the program. You're here Don't think hour, because she likes to sing along with the Pointer Sisters or mug for the camera that radio psychologist Dr. Laura isn't serious about providing help to thousands of listeners. Not just me. No, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't decide you're their mother. Right. That has to evolve. Right. How come you threw your life away? So that it's a... I don't think I did. How come you threw it away? These are things he needs to deal with. And if he wants you there more often, I'm sure he can ask. Tough talk and humor are just two of the ingredients in Dr. Laura Schlesinger's recipe of chicken soup for the soul. So much so, she is one of the top talk radio hosts in the country. Thanks, Dr. Laura. Thank you. It's my pleasure. The self-help maven was in town recently signing copies of her best-selling book. She also shared time with WSB Radio's answer man to the right, Neil Bortz. Mill, go west, follow the signs to K and G. She's quick to analyze part of Neil's personality. You did that all off the top of your head? I do them all, yeah. How do you remember all the details? I don't do commercials. Oh, come on, how do you remember that? You must have an extraordinary IQ. Trust me. I don't think so. You're extremely bright. Oh. I just, I just... Quick mind requires a very high IQ. I'm just having fun. Well, I'm glad you're having fun. You're also exceptionally bright, and you don't like to hear compliments. This is I have the best you pegged already. <laughs> Zeroing in on others is a crash she learned while earning a doctorate from Columbia University Medical School and studying psychotherapy at California universities. Although Georgians only have heard her for a year, Dr. Laura's been fine-tuning that skill on radio for almost 20 years. Even with all the experience, she can still get upset over one of her calls from 20 years ago ago because she had been gang raped by her boyfriend's buddies it came as a plea for help from a woman considering suicide I counted on her attachment to me and worked on her attachment to me you know but that she wanted to say goodbye to me meant she did not want to say goodbye I thought and then I said um, I guess you could uh, flush these the pills down the toilet and we can work together or you can hang up. That's gutsy. I don't believe I did that to this day. Yeah. And uh, there was about, it was about 60 seconds of dead air. And uh, that was the worst time this of my whole life. This gets to you, doesn't it? This it phone was, call yeah, gets to you. Yeah, and uh, then you heard a toilet flush. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting to me now. Would you stop? I'm sorry. It's very upsetting. And that was way, that was 20 years ago. But most of her calls are not like that. Instead, relationships appear to draw the most listeners. And even though fans are drawn to her frank, no-nonsense approach, Dr. Laura is the first to tell you she is not a problem solver. I think if anybody listens to me long enough, they know they're not going to get the solution, but they are going to get more truth about the direction. One of the main reasons people don't solve their problems is they don't want to face what the problem really is. And I think what the service I perform is I get them focused on what it really is, because then they can do something about it. But a solution, I, I can't do those in three minutes, even for myself. <laughs> My parents don't like him at all. <laughs> and what objectively do they not like about him? Um, well, he's not Jewish. What else do they not like about him? The fact, <laughs> I don't know, just... Oh, don't say I don't know and be so oblivious in your own life. What is your mission? It's very much about principles and values and, and ethics and how how the choices we make. And so much of psychology has been apologetic, you know, oh, well, you're codependent and you're a victim and all of this kind of stuff, and not challenging people. You know the right thing to do, that it's not comfortable or, or it won't give you your selfish needs right now is okay. And people don't seem to understand it's okay to suffer. We, we are at the, you know, there are medicines for everything. You're not even supposed to have blood vessels showing in your eyeballs ever. You got to get those out. I don't necessarily come to her for borrowing money. I'll just come to her for advice. And she'll say, well, you know, well, maybe if you, maybe if you didn't spend so much money going out and everything at all. Well, that's the advice. It's a lecture. Yes. And you're a young person learning. And you learn, you go to school, you have lectures. What do you think the professors do up there? Uh, Stroke you? But it's your different. Honey, honey, babe, you just told me your mother doesn't like the truth. I would offer you don't either. She knows building character is hard. But so what? I think guilt is very important. It keeps us on track. We, we know what the value should be. And when we stray from that and we feel pain, that's to remind us to reassess and get back on track. 
So the whole 60s thing of uh, you're laying guilt on me, one woman said that, you know, doing the single mother on purpose with mm -hmm. no guy on purpose, you mm -hmm. get my drift? Anyway, and she said, you're making me feel guilty. I said, oh, outstanding, I have succeeded, yes. Now do something constructive with the guilt and thank you for your call. <laughs> And that leads into the next question. There are some things you are vehemently opposed to, and one of them is having children outside of wedlock. And many older women are doing that now because they feel they haven't met that life's mate. Just want to smack them. Really. I'm nonviolent, but I just want to smack them. So I do it verbally. How self-centered can you be when I ask each of those women for yourself, would you ever choose to be brought up by a single mother who's putting you in daycare because she's going to work? These women who do that have big careers and they're not at home taking care of these little kids and they're obligating the child to never have a dad. Excuse me? How self-centered can you be and still have teeth? <laughs> Please. I just can't imagine. And I have people calling up, but it would make me happy. Yeah? Then get a pet. Get two pets. They can keep each other company. Dr. Laura practices what she preaches. After her first marriage ended in divorce, she threw all of her energies into a career. But by her late 30s, she realized her life was out of balance. So she married longtime friend Lou Bishop after what she calls a life-changing moment. We were watching public television, um, Nova, and they were showed the egg and the sperm. It was a whole hour, and by the end of the program, a baby was born. And I'm sitting there, tears streaming down my face. And just like that, it was the, all the denial of how I wanted that. It just all burst out. And uh, Lou was watching it with me, and he turned around and he said, oh my god, what's the matter? I want to be a mommy. And he said, oh, and he put his arm around me. It was a very cute moment. And I said, so we got to get married. <laughs> and he said, well, he'd been asking me for eight years, so it was like, all right, I'm ready, okay, let's do it. Well, I think you uh, are a person who practices what you preach yeah. because after your son was born, That's you home. left radio yeah, for three years. Home. That's it. And I've just always worked my life around him. You still plan what you do mm -hmm. around your son. Right. I take him everywhere if I do a speaking engagement. Uh, the deal is, like on the weekend, they have to have my whole family there. So if it's like in San Diego, they have to put us up at a hotel for the entire weekend so my kid can come down and play. It's either a family operation or it doesn't happen. You know, there are a lot of women who are sitting at home and they will say, oh, and I'm one of them, it never occurred to me to say to my boss, if you want me to do this, let me bring my kid. Yeah. That takes eggs. <laughs> <laughs> take strong ovaries. Um, uh, yeah, but you know, I just bit the bullet and I figured I would rather have some boss read me out and fire me than have my son ever look me in the face and say, where were you? One line and all it said, you had a less than idyllic childhood in New York. What's that all about? Well, my father was a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn who was uh, in the American Army liberating uh, Italy at the end of the war. My mother was to die for gorgeous, I mean made Sophia Loren look like a hag, you know what I'm saying here. And uh, they took one look at each other and I guess sparks flew and all of that. But I don't think they got to know each other real well and I think when you're young and hormones are involved and uh, all, you know, mm -hmm, uh, they came here, it was a problem that, you know, my father and I, Jewish boy from Brooklyn, married a not Jewish girl and that made the family go crazy and I the other families in Italy and are getting killed by the Nazis or whatever, this is all chaos. They were like oil and vinegar. And so there was always tension in the insecurity and, uh, uh, and anger and, you know, my mother would be very punitive with a cold sort of demeanor and so it was tough emotionally, you know. How did you deal with it as a kid? I withdrew. I read a lot, uh, I, you know, I'm beginning to think this is all a good thing. <laughs> I read a lot, I got very heavily into science, I built a whole laboratory in the basement, it was like the mad scientist, you know, I like count Frankenstein. And uh, so I really put myself into academics a lot. And uh, I don't know whether that was totally as a response to, but it was certainly, you know, where I could go and feel comfortable. Looking at your life now, if you had had the knowledge then that you have now, how would you have handled it? I would have sat them down <laughs> and told them to get a grip. 
At age 48, Dr. Laura is enjoying the fruits of her long overnight success. She continues to teach, operates a private counseling practice, and is awaiting the release of a new book. She has no plans to move into television, but she has started a newsletter, and she continues to practice her black belt karate. And if you're a regular listener, you know why Dr. Laura chose that sport. It, it, why did you get into it? I thought it looked beautiful. I think oh, most girls looked at you know, the, the pink tutus and thought that was the living end. I always thought that was pretty silly. Uh, I looked at Bruce Lee doing a kick and I went, now that's gorgeous. I have to do that. Well, I would say that's probably one of the most important things about taking martial arts. You don't look or act like a victim. No fear of that from the good doctor. You might also like to know Dr. Laura Schlesinger says she's never lost at the game Scrabble. And she says she has one of the most complete Star Trek memorabilia collections in the universe. When Monica comes back, 